Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and you're listening to my blog, or well, my video blog of the 26th of January, 2017. And today I thought it would be interesting to open up by uh, just briefly going over an interesting conversation that we had, uh, or that I, I had uh, with some people at work about um, the, the topic of tier. Uh, TYR, which I believe was an uh, ancient uh, German uh, deity myth, uh, came up, and it led to a, a, a longer conversation about the ideas that are vastly part of how a culture, uh, how a culture views uh, the world, how they enter and fade from. Uh, they enter and fade from, I guess, popular discourse. Uh, basically, there's this idea that you'd have this chain, this li uh, li living literary tradition uh, with certain characters, and they exist, and myths spread, and they keep evolving, new stories come about, and then they stop eventually when that culture goes through sufficient transformation. And, and then occasionally they get found by a later culture, which grabs onto them and does something different. Sometimes the original culture isn't quite done with them yet. Sometimes the original culture is essentially long gone. Um, and so the, so you did, uh, the conversation, it started with this mention of Tyr, the ancient Greek god, or uh, ancient German god. But then it, uh, but then there was some question as to whether the original mention was of that or was of Dungeons and Dragons, which is kind of an interactive st storytelling uh, game where one person uh, will play as the storyteller, and then everybody else will play as characters in the story, and they kind of collaboratively uh, build a story. I mean, like, the storyteller basically acts as the world, and everybody else acts as a character. And there, there's more to it than that. There's a little bit more substance to, uh, to it than that, but it's a very loose experience. And there are some, like, gamey aspects, uh, and there's, like, the notion that, like, you might be a wizard or a warrior or something, and you might get more stuff or lose some stuff, gain status in society or lose it. Um, but but it's essentially collaborative storytelling, and in Dun uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, one of the worlds that uh, that the company that produced a lot of the material to basically just to start people down this path of telling stories together. Uh, um, there was a company called TSR that published most of the original Dungeons and Dragons stuff, and so they produce worlds essentially like fictional. Uh, places where stories can happen. Like, say, the world of Harry Potter would be a modern one, but this all mostly predated Harry Potter. I mean, it's still going on, but it, it used to be a really big thing, and I don't think it's quite as big as it was uh, anymore. But uh, some of the worlds that TSR published, they had, um, they drew upon mythology. So you'd have maybe Greek gods or Roman gods or uh, Babylonian gods or or German gods, and sometimes it would be more or less an attempt to lift the beliefs of these old cultures into a modern story, and sometimes you'd see some deeper transformation of, of them in the lift, particularly because the the lifting process usually kind of filtered them through modern eyes and put modern concepts and perspectives as the context, or at least as part of the fabric of the of the story and the world that, that people would be collaborating on. And, and so ancient mythologies where people would know them better, they, there'd be a little bit more fidelity. Like the Greek gods, nowadays uh, most educated people will have a vague idea of it. Uh, they'll have a modern conception of it, but they'll have a, a at least a reasonable idea of like 
what were each of the ancient Greek gods? What were their specialties? What did they do? Um, what were their views on things? Stuff like that. And uh, for more obscure mythologies like the ancient German deities, and I'm not really sure why the German, why the ancient Germans lost out over the ancient Greeks or several of the other old old myths, but. Uh, but so for Tyr, nobody is uh, is particularly aware of. Or I mean, I, there, there are some specialists, but but most people, even pretty educated people, unless they took a particular interest, uh, they won't know really much about Tyr, and most of them probably wouldn't even be able to recognize the name. Things might be different in Europe. I am talking about the American no version of the highly educated person. Um, but any, uh, anyhow, so you would take, for, for a somewhat more obscure set of ancient religions, you would kind of, you might take the names, and you might take a, some vague flavoring, but mostly make new stuff up and give new contents uh, for them, for these mythical worlds where people might enter. And I remember TSR did that. They had a, uh, one of these worlds was called Forgotten Realms, and Tyr was a god in, in that, but I suspect that that Tyr had very little to do with the ancient German god, as opposed to, say, like D&D uh, &D worlds that had Poseidon as a god. I mean, everybody kind of knows that Poseidon would be a sea god, uh, brother to Zeus and Hades, and, uh, and a whole bunch of the female gods of that generation. Uh, lived in Olympus theoretically, but mostly lived in the ocean, and so on. Um, but by, by grabbing onto these old ideas and recycling them, I think that they make the ideas a lot more relevant and thought about than they otherwise would have been, even if their perceptions are, or even if the perceptions that exist of them are not the most accurate to what the concepts originally were. Well, or at least what they were during the heyday of those faiths, because a lot of primitive and even more modern faiths, they change a lot over time. And uh, like, for example, there's pretty good reason to believe that Juda Judaism grew out of a polytheistic religion. Um, and there are both linguistic hints and there are uh, um, there are mythological ties and even uh, hints within the uh, within Torah itself that kind of hint at earlier conceptions of uh, of what was going on in the supernatural uh, supernatural world um, and so faiths at, uh, faiths at the time changed uh, you look at ancient Greek gods, ancient German gods, ancient, ancient Norse gods, and you uh, you would trace evolution of these myths too. And whenever things got written down, you would then later on find new additions to those myths that sometimes were a pretty strong recharacterization of the way earlier uh, writings had them. And ideas would flow between different cultures and uh, and so on. Um, so I, th I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, like, I, I don't think it, it's at all a bad thing for ideas to flow from one culture to another. I think it's the most natural and healthy thing in the world, pretty much. Uh, well, I, uh, that is a figure of speech. What I just mean is that I, I don't see anything negative in it. I think it's interesting to have these ideas sustained a bit. I know that a few other cultural, uh, mechanisms keep these ideas floating around. Um, like you end up having comics, for example, gr grabbing like the very corners of Norse mythology and carrying them around with the character of Thor and, and so on. But uh, but yeah, they're, they're kind of sideshows, but they're, uh, but they're not completely gone. And it makes one, I mean, I guess the, the growth of societies up to this size, maybe it makes it unlikely that culture, cultural events can be truly forgotten nowadays, but I guess we, we would 
we wouldn't know. Maybe they'd just be buried among how much there is out there. They certainly, it's hard to be prominent in such an active and gigantic world, but it's also probably a little bit harder to die for an idea, uh, anyhow. Um, I, you'll see that I have the lights on in this video. I'm thinking about trying to find some good uh, webcasting software. I don't really want to spend a whole lot of money because I'm not sh absolutely certain that I'm going to keep doing this particularly often, but it would be nice to have the ability to do any edits that I wanted to. Since basically right now, if I start one of these, then I keep talking until it ends, and I really I would be unlikely to stop and uh, and start from scratch if it, if I were already more than a minute or two in, because I don't know one of the, one of the things that I found with writing is that once I say something, I'm much more likely to forget it. Like, not, maybe not almost completely, but it moves it from something that's floating around near the front of the things that I think about to the rear. And it would take some time to bubble back up. And so the danger when talking on a video, if I were to actually imagine uh, starting a video over, is that all the stuff that I probably wanted to talk about, that itch would be scratched and the topic would be moved to the back of my mind. And... Uh, and that would make it so that I, I, I guess I like the, the benefit of having just chewed on some issues for a while and then possibly writing on them, or at least as I'm trying to get back into, uh, into it, uh, talking about it in video form. And, and I don't, uh, and so, yeah, uh, starting from scratch, it, it's just a loss. Um, but it, it would be nice uh, to have more options. Like, let's just say that I, for some reason, got a phone call now, or uh, I completely blew, uh, drew a blank for about uh, 20 seconds, or even I just want to insert some, uh, some text or, uh, or a link or, uh, or something like that. It, uh, it would be kind of nice to be able to do that um, without... Uh, I don't know, without doing very unpleasant surgery in the YouTube video editor or actually getting my physical whiteboard down here and using that as a way to illustrate things. I've done that in the past. It doesn't work particularly well. So I, um, yeah, if, if I find something, I'll probably talk about it a little bit after I get used to it. Um, other topics... I guess I think I might have mentioned in my last vid video that my cats are getting pretty old. Um, but they, up until very recently, they haven't really started to act old. Like, they've been very active, um, energetic, haven't really shown signs uh, of much weariness. I think one of them is a little bit over 15, and the other one is probably maybe 14 or 13. But I've kind of noticed a, a little bit more weariness uh, in them uh, recently. And I'm hoping that that doesn't mean that they're getting very near their end. Uh, I mean, they're still doing okay. Uh, and it, maybe they were just tired. Um, but I guess you, you, you just start to wonder when you realize like exactly how old a pet is. Um, and when you start to just see signs of a general weariness... Uh, yeah, it, it has me, I, I guess worried is not quite the right word because I know that it's going to happen eventually. I mean, it happens to humans a lot slower and I know that like I don't have nearly as much energy as I had uh, back when I was in my 20s um, or even my early 30s. And I uh, certainly like my hair has been graying, uh, graying a bit. You can't really see it here. Well, maybe you can. I, I, I guess the small preview that I, I see of the webcam, uh, I can't see it in this view, but it's definitely there. And, uh, and just in general, I'm, I know that like it's just my body isn't nearly where it was uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But, um, but that's life. I mean, I, I don't see it as something to be greatly feared. It just it happens to all of us. Uh, we're 
we're all just part of this cycle and eventually you die and that's just the way it goes. But I know that when my cats go, I'm going to really uh, miss them because they've been pretty constant companions for a long time. And I think I've given them a pretty happy life. Uh, and I hope to keep on doing so for as long as they're around. Um, but yeah, it, I just, it, it has me a little, little bit, uh, maybe in an adjustment, just see, starting to see a little bit more that they're getting kind of near the end. Uh, probably not quite at, uh, I mean, I don't think there, there's anything imminent, but it just, you can kind of see uh, aging, the, the signs of aging, they're, they're visible in just about any uh, living thing. I guess uh, I, I want to also briefly mention, um, uh, or I want to briefly go over uh, what it's like to be a programmer in infrastructure. And then I work for a large tech company that you have probably heard of. Uh, not certainly, but, but probably. And, uh, and I work on coding on infrastructure. And so for anybody who is a programmer, this isn't going to be like any particularly big mystery. You already know what it's like to work with code. You might not really know what's like to work with code in infrastructure. But, um, but, for, but there are some people who conceivably could be watching this who don't code at all. And so, and I don't remember if I've talked about this in early uh, in any of my much earlier videos. That's one of the problems with like most of these things being stream of consciousness, in that, like most of the time, two weeks after I write something, it's gone from my head, and I don't know if I've ever written about it before. Uh, just there's way too many things to think about in the world, and just. Uh, Talking or writing, it's just kind of one of these uh, purgative processes. You put your brain into a mode, and you're spitting out the information, and you feel kind of like free and lightweight afterwards, and it's kind of like a permission to forget, but you also forget that you did it. And you can be really organized to try and not rely on your own memories, uh, but, but just I, I really, I never have and probably never will remember what I've written or talked about. Uh, much after I've done it. But, um, so, programming and infrastructure, basically, what does modern infrastructure look like? You ha typically have uh, somewhere between uh, hundreds of servers and hundreds of thousands of servers in a medium or larger tech company. And those servers are spread out over several places. And they're not all doing the same thing. And so you have kind of a... You, you have organizations of servers uh, that, are, that, that serve particular purposes. And these are like little fleets. And some of them will do this. Some of them will do that. You might have anywhere between 10 different things that servers do and... A uh, hundred different things that servers do, maybe more. And so the servers, they're usually running Unix, uh, often Linux, and you have a code base. And the code, uh, and the code base will be like one or more repositories where you have code that does stuff. Sometimes the stuff is managing infrastructure on one or more servers, and sometimes it's a chunk of code that runs and serves some business need. Uh, like, for example, a database box. Um, you, you might have uh, the, the code that goes into maintaining a database box. You'd have some really generic code that's like, how do I get code onto this box? How do I configure it? Uh, hey, keep Postgres 9.4 installed. And you might have a way to say, OK, let's upgrade a few of these to 9.5 and see how it goes and see if anything breaks. You might have test servers that'll run a test version of your database so that you can play around more and find good settings or test new versions of software. 
And you obviously, you, you won't have just database servers. You'll have application servers and web servers and um, monitoring systems and, uh, and some things that will run on every system in your fleet, uh, like, hey, give me all your logs and I'll ship them off to some central place. And then you'll have things, uh, you'll, you'll have other servers there be like, I will receive all those logs from everywhere and process them and stick them into uh, a few databases. And then you'll have systems that'll be like, okay, I'd like to query all the logs across all my um, uh, 200,000 machines and look for certain kinds of patterns and so on. And so you'll, you'll have build farms that will always uh, grab stuff out of the repos and build software for you and ship them out to your servers. And you'll have systems that are designed just to help you classify all your servers so that you can uh, nicely like query, hey, how many servers do I have that are, uh, that are my database servers in the data center that I have in Idaho? I mean, I don't know if people actually have data centers in Idaho, but that's an example of something you might want to know. Um, like, name all those servers and tell me how many there are. And, and then you have teams that are always thinking about capacity, like, is the load too high on my database servers? Do I need to order more physical servers, or do I need to grab a higher percentage of how many database systems I have, or I mean, how many systems I have for, for a database? And so you might, these might be physical systems, or you might have a cloud provider that handles at least a few of the details of these, uh, uh, of, of this whole process for you. Or you might have a mix. You might have some stuff on a cloud provider and some stuff uh, that you have in your own data, uh, data centers. Uh, or you might be on multiple cloud providers there are a few even more unusual ways to do things uh, that you could be doing. But, but basically, an infrastructure person is, is going to be focused around either keeping that whole thing running, or they'll focus on something that's about managing the, uh, managing the, the fleet of servers, managing something close to the operating system or close to things like logging, uh, close to, uh, to things like monitoring or security, uh, stuff like that. Those are your infrastructure people. Uh, or they could be like, I'm working on a system which will continually grab stuff from the uh, version control stuff and build packages for you. And sometimes these careers are split out a little bit more. Like that, for example, might be called a build engineer. But it could, uh, but you'd still often hire a systems engineer to do it, or you might have some variety on your team in terms of what people specialize on. And so, typically, most of what a systems engineer does, or an infrastructure engineer or infra infrastructure programmer does, you're still working with code. You have your code in a version control system. It might be Git might be Mercurial, might be a, a one of a few other things. Uh, you might have a continuous build platform, and there are a whole bunch of those out there that will always grab things out of the code base and try and compile it for you and give you errors if it doesn't build, or they'll run tests on it, say, oh, you know, this doesn't meet the tests that you defined for this code base, so it doesn't get a stamp of approval. You're not allowed to send it out to your servers. And th this is all a good thing. You, you want this stuff to prevent errors because the, the generally the bigger the infrastructure, the more people are going to care about and use it to uh, they'll depend on, on it working right to do their work. And so that's, that's basically what I do. I, I work on uh, the, the common term for this is diffs. And a diff is a change to an existing code base. And it would typically be like, uh, hey, there's five files, and I want to change this chunk of this file, and this chunk of that file, and this chunk of that file. And there's a reason that you would do it, too. Like, I'm working on adding a new feature to this software component that somebody else uh, would really like to have. 
or I am worried about how this component is going to scale, I have identified a performance problem, and my diff addresses these performance problems. Um, or, uh, oh shoot, things are really broken now, uh, and I'm trying to recover this software system from a really bad state. Um, and so a, a, a diff is basically, it's, it's a set of changes to a code base that are designed to meet a need. And so typically I'm working on many diffs at a time, somewhere usually between two and 10, um, to add new features, to solve problems, uh, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes it's to clean up some code that I think, oh, this is really complicated. And, uh, and com complication, basically complexity is always the enemy in it for any programmer. It's not the only enemy. Uh, but complexity is a big enemy, like stuff that's not automated enough is a problem. Looks like there's some fireworks going on outside. Interesting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there are a whole bunch of problems that you're, uh, a whole bunch of enemies that you're trying to deal with in, in programming. And complexity is one of them, because the more complex a piece of code is, the harder it is to work with. Both, uh, both in terms of programming and in terms of finding out, is this code broken when a larger system is broken? Like something simple, you can easily analyze it and usually tell if it's not working right, why it's not working right. More complicated piece of software, you might spend a good amount of time. You might like notice, oh, it's this piece of code that's not working right, but this is a gigantic piece of code. And if I actually want to find the particular problem then you, you have a whole lot of work to do. So, like, a programmer will generally want to try and keep things as simple as they can be, at least as one of the concerns going in. Like, there, there are some other concerns like performance, like really good logging, like looking really uh, clean and being easy to refactor. Uh, I mean, there are other things that go into code, but, but these are all pretty common concerns. And, and an infrastructure programmer will be interested, as interested in them as most other kinds of programmers. And so typically, my most of what I do every day is working through some diffs. Uh, and people will send diffs to me, uh, particularly on, piece, uh, on code bases where I have a particular expertise. I'm reviewing a lot of other people's diffs. And you'd have a uh, basically a system that will display a diff. And you'd see, like, typically on one side of the screen, this is the code uh, before the, the diff. This is the code that if you accepted the diff, this is what it would look like. And so you'd go through and line by line, uh, you, you'd, you'd typically chat. Like, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right way to do things. And you'd attach a comment to the diff. And, uh, I mean, you're not going to do it for every line of the diff. But for anything where you want to comment, you typically would. And then you'd submit all your comments, and then the other per person might then update the diff with some more changes based on your comments. And then eventually, after enough back and forth, usually the diff is going to be accepted, after which it's the job of the version control system to apply the diff. That is, it takes all the changes that somebody expressed in their diff to the code base and actually puts them into the code base. And, uh, and then you'd have the build process, and then the next person who's working on the code, they'd get that, uh, that patched version of the code base. That is the version that had those changes from the diff merged in. And this is kind of the life of most programmers. We, we work uh, around large code bases and diffs and a whole lot of chatter between people that hopefully leads to usually better code. And it, it, it's a very social act. Like, writing your code isn't a very social act. Like, when you're doing that initial writing at the diff, you're typically going off on your own and thinking, and you might have some questions, but usually it's a fairly solitary activity. But when the diff is done, or mostly done, then you'll be working with your coworkers to make sure that they think it's OK. They might offer advice or suggestions or something. And sometimes that's a little bit annoying if they have a whole bunch of changes they want 
and sometimes if you get like five programmers, they might not agree on how to how to do something in a code base. But eventually you reach some kind of a consensus or you just decide, you know, I'm just gonna give up on this. Either we don't need it or somebody else would really like to do it or I'm just sick of it or something like that. But most of the time uh, you start a diff, you have that back and forth and some future revised version of the diff will land in the code and be applied. And, and that's basically what it is to be an infrastructure programmer. I mean, there are other things that are not programming, like you're going to keep an eye on systems and you'll get monitoring, or you'll be thinking about systems and wondering, what do I need to change to make sure that this will be stable in the long term? Or, oh, we know that we're going to need to do uh, to do this big change to these software systems about six months down the line. Um, what is the right thing to do uh, in the meantime. Uh, and so you have monitoring and pages and proactive maintenance and stuff like that. But but this is true for like most, most types of code. Uh, it's just the focus of an infrastructure programmer is, uh, is on infrastructure. Whereas uh, programmers on other types of projects, like if you're working on an Android app, or a de desktop app, you would be still programming and you still probably have this kind of diff-based process, uh, but you uh, you would be just a little, uh, yeah, you'd just be working on it, uh, working to make a different type of thing. You're still engineers, usually working together uh, towards a goal. Um, and some people are just really amazing debuggers, and I don't want to minimize the importance of that. Like if, if something is busted, and you need to figure out, like, uh, what is wrong. Uh, if somebody is absolutely amazing at doing that kind of thing, then that is a really useful skill to have. But, uh, but yeah, that, but you, you kind of need a good set of skills on a team. Not everybody needs to be equally good at the important stuff, but a team needs to have the right number of people who have good levels of skill at the various important things. So, yeah, that's, that's what it's like to, to work in, in programming uh, on infrastructure. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out whether there were other things that I wanted to talk about. Because I think I talked about, um, I re remember right, I, I talked at least a little bit about what it's like to live in New York City. Talked a little bit about, uh, a little bit about aging. Talked a little bit about... I think I've ever talked. Um, yeah, um, I guess that's that's probably all for now. Um, I I have been uh, playing a game that I'm rather enjoying called Nefarious, which appears to be like a it's a fairly Mega Man like game, but you're playing as a uh, as a villain who's trying to kidnap princesses. Uh, it has a pretty good sense of humor to it. It's also fairly tough. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying that right now. And it looks like Dishonored 2 just came out for the PC, which uh, I'm look, looking forward to playing. Um, I've still been playing a fair amount of, uh, of Fallout 4, mostly just going back and wandering around my settlements and fiddling with things a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and occasionally going out and wandering into like more adventure places. But uh, I haven't been doing too much uh, else on that front. I really haven't had a whole lot of time. Uh, some of the stuff that we're doing at, uh, at work has been keeping me exceedingly busy. And I've never been particularly good at work-life balance. It's not that I've been pressured into doing this, but I just something about my personality. I it's not that I'm driven to do work per se, but I am bothered by some classes of things when they're not done, or by people needing th uh, certain types of things. Uh, like it really, really irks me not to have some kinds of things done. So. 
I end up putting a whole lot of, uh, outside of work hours, doing a lot of things that, uh, again, without pressure, but it, it means that, like, during busy times, uh, a whole lot of my personal life gets eaten up, um, which I'm pretty okay with. It's good to, uh, to have a feeling of purpose, and I don't really have a whole lot going on outside of work. Uh, but it has meant that I, a lot of time that I otherwise might have spent on uh, on games or taking long walks or things like that, uh, I'm not spending right now. I mean, the long walks thing, I'm a little bit disincentivized on that because it's a little bit chilly out. Although it's not as chilly as I, I, I would think um, for uh, January. Like, it, it probably, sh we should have gotten much colder days than we have this year, I barely needed my heavy coat at all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit weirded out by that, but uh, I guess it's just a warm year. Unless, uh, I mean, I guess there's always that worry that our, um, that climate change is like being even more profound than we've been hoping. Like, it's a little bit of a nervous thing. Um, and there are some other topics that I was thinking about talking about. Uh, like I was really bothered by the um, by the Trump and the Bradley Manning thing. Uh, or I'm sorry, too many names uh, in my head. The the Trump and the uh, uh, fudge. What is? Um, yeah, yeah. No, actually, I think that is. Uh, there was a whistleblower some time back. I mean, there have been a lot of kind of well-known whistleblowers recently. Uh, but uh, Manning was a particular one of them, and Trump committed uh, this, the sentence uh, on one of the last days uh, uh, in office. I'm sorry, uh, Obama committed the sentence on one of his last days in office. Uh, and... Um, and recently, there was some criticism from Manning of Obama for not having been the right uh, the right president, or so on. And Trump criticized Manning for this, which felt very weird, both in the sense that like Trump has often criticized Obama. Um, he hasn't done it recently, but you scoot back a few months, and it was pretty much constant. But also, the nature of the criticism was, I guess I am repeating this uh, from my Google Plus post, but the nature uh, of the criticism felt unusual in that Trump felt that it was odd, uh, uh, or uh, Trump thought that it was bizarre that Manning would criticize Obama right after having had a sentence commuted by Obama. And I actually don't find this odd. I think that it's a pretty normal thing. Uh, and But it, it shows an interesting difference in worldviews here. And that, to me, there are large areas of life where you're operating out of principles or values that, that feel right to you. And I think that generally presidents will tend to pardon people either for political reasons uh, like trading of favors or a whole bunch of things. It's just a perk of the job in that sense. It's not a particularly great perk to see used, but nonetheless, it happens a lot. Uh, and then there are people who feel that justice wasn't quite served in this condition. And while I, th I don't really agree with Obama's judgment on this particular point, I'm not deeply bothered by it, uh, but Obama apparently felt that Manning's treatment was... Uh, uh, just not a good in good service of, of justice. It's like, okay, uh, I mean, admittedly, Obama is a law professor, and, uh, and he probably knows a whole lot more details, both public and private, on the case. So you shouldn't take my disagreeing with Obama's judgment on this as being a particularly well-informed disagreement on my part. It's not. Uh, I have not followed that case very much, um, and uh, but but the thing is, because I think that the uh, commutation was done, but uh, for reasons of 
of principle, that is, somebody thinking justice was not served here, I don't think it creates a debt. Uh, uh, Manning doesn't owe, uh, owe Obama anything for that commutation. And, uh, and Obama, I think, was not doing it in any way as a favor uh, to Manning. Uh, Obama was doing it because he felt, presumably, that it was the right thing to do. And I think, in general, there are large parts of life where it doesn't matter whether you like or you don't like somebody. You, uh, your interactions with them are not are not entirely determined, or often not even significantly determined by how much you like them. They're determined by your principles and your notions of the way that society should work, and so on. In in the same way that like there are, there are a bunch of people that I really really dislike in life. I haven't bumped into any of them uh, for a good while now, but people I dislike. But that doesn't mean that if uh, if somebody was trying uh, was planning to murder them or something like that, that I would uh, just stand back and watch it happen, uh, watch it happen, or anything like that. I, I wouldn't. I, I uh, but it wouldn't be about them that that I would intervene. It would be because I believe that. A, a well-formed society, a just society, doesn't have some of these horrible things that happen to people, even if they're people I don't like. Um, and uh, and so I would be doing it for the principle, and I still, after the event is over, I still would quite likely be mad at them, or really dislike them, or something. I, I, uh, but they wouldn't know me anything, because, uh, because I, I wasn't doing it as a favor, wasn't doing it looking for uh, looking for uh, for any type of return. It's not transactional. It's just me living my life according to my principles. And, and I mean, this has happened a few times in life before, but I don't really want to get into the details of any of those situations because they were, at least most of them were kind of sensitive and they were a really long time ago. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, the the perspective that I see from the criticism from Trump is that of a world where human interactions are primarily not about principles or notions of the way things should be, so much as trading of favors and debts and, uh, and notions of friends and enemies determining most of how one interacts with somebody. Uh, and, and I think like anybody who's like really devoid of principles and who mostly is just looking out to benefit people near them, somebody who's not trying to live by a creed in any sense, uh, they're going to live life that way. And I'm bothered by that, even like in like random people. Uh, and that like if, even if a really close relative of mine who I deeply care for went around murdering people, of course I would turn them in because I don't want to live in a society where people uh, either perform those kinds of murders or people wouldn't turn in somebody who's in those circumstances. Uh, there are notions of fairness at stake here. But, but again, not in everybody's head, and, and I think that it should be in everybody's head, um, but it's not. But I get really worried when I see powerful people who live by creeds of you do something for me, I'll do something for you. Uh, you criticize me, I'm going to go after you. And, but I think this is the this is the way of life for for Trump. It's another thing that bothers me about him, uh, particularly as a person who has uh, a fair amount of power and has always had a lot of wealth. Uh, well. Not, hasn't always had a lot of wealth in some senses, but has had command over a lot of money, whether whether that's through debt or not, is immaterial. Uh, have, being able to materialize millions of dollars to do something as needed uh, is a form of wealth, even if one's net balance is is fairly low. Um, like it's kind of monetary power, it's money as a tool and not necessarily a stable money as a tool of power. I'm kind of quibbling here. Um, but yeah, there, this is not something we should want in the leader. 
And this isn't meant as a being a particularly political statement. I, I am a fairly political person, but, uh, but my politics are not particularly tied to uh, any party, and they're and I hope that they're pretty far from being tribal. Uh, but yeah, we we shouldn't want to be, uh, to have that kind of tribalism and that kind of deep loyalty. And I will uh, I will defend you no matter what if you do this for me or something like that. That's not a healthy attitude, um, even in ordinary people uh, like like take for example if you're a, a mother or a father and your kid does something bad you should you shouldn't be lying for your kid uh, and you should be bothered if you see other people lying for their kid truth is too important uh, and but yeah what happened happened uh, I mean he was elected and uh, and we are living in the world that we inherited from the past, and we have to try and make the right decisions and live life in sustainable ways moving forward. Um, so um, I guess that's probably all I have to talk about right now. Again, if there are topics where people would like to hear some more if they have any questions or uh, something like that. Uh, you can leave them in comments on the video and I'll try and get to them the next time I do one of these, uh, unless I think that they're really boring or uh, otherwise not the kind of thing that I want to comment on. But I hope to at least cast, catch a fairly wide net and be willing to talk about anything if, if people would like to see that here, and of course, if nobody ever watches these, or if almost nobody does, no giant loss, I am somewhat amused to be making them, and it is kind of fun to put them up there and see what happens. Um, so long.